Everyone, welcome to the Year What's the podcast all about today that gives you just enough information to effectively be that guy at the party, causing all your friends to question, hey, who invited you? Like, seriously, why are you here? And I'm your host, Michael Montalvo, and for the next few minutes, we will swim through the river of time to try to find out what makes today truly unique. On this episode, we examine the events that occurred September 16th. When we think of bombings, typically, I think we only think of them in a more contemporary setting. That is to say, the Oklahoma City bombing, the Centennial Olympic Park bombing, the World Trade Center bombing, and the less contemporary gunpowder plot of 1605. Now, obviously, there are countless more that I haven't mentioned, but perhaps the most surprising to me is the subject of today's episode. This one might be a bit graphic. The year was 1920, and 100 years ago, on this day, September 16th, the Wall Street bombing occurred, killing over 30 people to become the worst terror attack pre-9-11 in New York City. The day began like any other. People woke, ate breakfast, and went to work. At least, that's what I assume happened. It was 1920. At approximately 12.01 p.m., a horse-drawn carriage containing 100 pounds of dynamite exploded in front of the J.P. Morgan & Co. headquarters, the U.S. sub-treasury, and the assay office just down the road from the New York Stock Exchange. The blast from the carriage would ultimately derail a streetcar, send debris 34 stories up into the air, and sent pieces of the horse hundreds of yards away. Many people, such as stockbroker Joseph P. Kennedy, were literally thrown into the air by the sheer force of the blast. Reporter George Weston, who survived by ducking into a doorway, would later write, Almost in front of the steps leading up to the Morgan Bank was the mutilated body of a man. Other bodies, most of them silent in death, lay nearby. As I gazed horror-stricken at the sight, One of these forms, half-naked and seared with burns, started to rise. It struggled, then toppled, and fell lifeless into the gutter. Andrew Dunn, who survived the incident, would later say, That was the loudest noise I had ever heard in my life. It was enough to knock you out by itself. Presumably, this meant that Dunn did not hear the blast of Krakatoa. The noise from the explosion was heard throughout Lower Manhattan and across the East River, and when the shock was over, smoke lifted into the air as the streets lay covered in a layer of glass and debris from the surrounding buildings. Thirty people would die instantly from the explosion. Three hundred were injured. From those, an additional eight would die from their injuries. As you would expect, after the explosion... The stock exchange was immediately shut down, and police and soldiers were called in to help those who were injured, as well as to look for clues to determine who's responsible for this. So how did they find out the identity of the people responsible? They didn't. The description of the driver and of the carriage were vague and unhelpful, and despite the FBI interviewing hundreds of people who were there in the area, they got little to no information. After the explosion, no one came forward to claim responsibility. It was initially thought to be the work of radical leftist political groups. The nation had recently seen raids on communist headquarters, and so people seemed to believe that Bolsheviks were now plotting to take over America. According to CBSNews.com, this was brought about over U.S. capitalism and wealth inequality that had been growing for decades. Italian anarchists were viewed as possible suspects due to their frustration over the imprisonment of Italian anarchists Nicola Sacco and Bartholomew Vanziti, who had been falsely convicted of murder while doing an armed robbery the year before. But that's not all that led them down the path to Italian anarchists. According to FBI.gov, prior to the explosion, a letter carrier found four crudely spelled and printed flyers in the area. 
The flyers were from a group calling themselves the American Anarchist Fighters and demanded the release of political prisoners. Remember, we will not tolerate any longer. Free the political prisoner or it will be sure death for all of you. American Anarchist Fighters. The letters that were discovered were similar to ones used in previous bombings that were formatted by Italian anarchists. So, using this information, it seemed like they were the most likely suspect. The Bureau tried to track down the printing of the flyers, but again found no success. Using the information they gathered, the most likely suspect was an Italian anarchist Luigi Galliani, although again nothing could be proven and he fled the country. Over the next few years, the case would fall apart as hot leads turned cold and led to dead ends. Still, another suspect was that of Edwin P. Fisher, who was a champion tennis player and frequent mental patient. He had actually predicted the explosion on Wall Street to take place mid-September, however, he was in Canada at the time and was later dropped as a suspect and eventually committed to a psychiatric ward. Another theory as to why this all happened was that it was an assassination attempt on J.P. Morgan Jr.'s life, but this was quickly dismissed as he was in Europe at the time. That's all I really have to say on that one, I just felt like I needed to include it. Despite being able to reconstruct the bomb and the fuse as well as the found evidence in the form of the flyers, no arrests could be made because of a lack of any real evidence. So what happened after? Wall Street actually opened the next day. Bandaged clerks returned to work and all the evidence from the explosion was literally swept away. New Yorkers gathered in the afternoon to sing America the Beautiful and the National Anthem, but those responsible were never held accountable. The only memorial to speak of are the shrapnel scars, remnants of the blast that can still be seen today because the building was never repaired. That's going to do it for us today. If you like this podcast and want to hear more, give us a rate and a review. That helps me out and helps steer this in a direction that is hopefully good for all. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can find the Year Was audio version on your podcast app of choice. You can find me on social media and at YouTube at the Apple Cider Club. And as always, I want to thank the Tim Kreitz Band for our musical theme. And thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. Come on.